Praise the Lord. Merry Christmas. Excited about this time of year, as I am every year, these two holidays of Christmas and Easter, just great times of remembering the Lord and who He is and all He's done, and He was and is Lord at His birth, His death, His resurrection, amen? And He will be Lord at His next coming, in which I hope you'll all be there for. Amen? amen. Don't be dead. Let's wake up this morning. Somebody say, praise the Lord, amen. Shout a little bit. Do something. Wake your spouse up, whatever it takes. Just a couple of... Uh, Weeks from now, we'll be having our elder ordination, January 22nd. There are three men who have been presented to the church for ordination. That is Don Height and Lauren Geldard and Lenny Zahn. Uh, two of those men from the Spring Campus, one of them from our Magnolia Campus. Two will be ordained here on that Sunday morning, one ordained over there. So we have ordination services at both campuses. We're excited about these men. believe that God has raised them up for such a time as this. And uh, their names were presented by the church body and gone through the elder council. We have uh, grilled them, baked them, sautéed them, <laughs> ran them over the coals and back. And these are men that love God and I think are honorable candidates for this ministry of, of eldership. So uh, let's be praying for them. We give the church a 30-day notice, basically. We give the men 30-day notice. So in these next 30 days between that Sunday and this Sunday, they have time to really seek God's face. And if at any point one feels led or all feel led to say this is not the time nor the place, uh, this is a, a word they can have freedom to share with the elder council, step out, but uh, they would not have come this far if they didn't believe the Lord was leading them. At the same time, we give the church 30 days to look over these, to expect these men and look at their lives and rejoice with them, pray for them, and perhaps there may be one in here that's a scoundrel. <laughs> Please tell me so that we can deal with it properly in the right time, the right place. You have 30 days to report them, amen? But... Uh, I told all of them I didn't want to hear anything come up in these next 30 days, that they were privately getting drunk on the weekends or whatever it might be, beating their wife or so and so. But praise the Lord. We praise God. These are godly men. Look forward to that elder, uh, ordination service. So that is coming soon. We're continuing a series of messages. I know some folks, when you get into seasonal times, like to change to seasonal messages. But I really can't think of a more seasonal message than if we deal with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about the mystery and the mission of the body of Christ. We're in the ninth sermon. Can you believe it already? Where we're talking about the witness of the church. And again, it's not our average Christmas sermon. We usually kind of share seasonal messages, but we don't always do it. But if you think about the context of this message today, which is the message and the witness that the church has to a lost world, then certainly it's a great time to preach it. When Jesus, who comes and announces to the world that the angels announce that he is Emmanuel, God with us, and that he has come to save us from our sins, then certainly it's a Christmas message. And that's the message of the church that we share. It's not just once a year when we talk about Christmas or twice we might do a sermon on it, but a time of the year when we realize that the greatest gift ever given was the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of his life, and you and I have been given the glorious opportunity to take that message, message of life. It's a message of hope. In fact, it's, it's like the world is in need of a rescue mission and we are the rescuers for the mission. We've all seen those times on TV when you see uh, the stories through the news and the media about someone who's been rescued. I recently saw about a, a man who caught a little boy, jumped out the window. And we can always remember 9-11 about all those hero rescuers who ran in and tried to save all those people and from the tragedy that, that faced them at 9-11. And we see that... Uh, we, we, sometimes we venerate these people like heroes in our culture, but you need to understand that if you're a Christian, you're always on rescue mission. Right. And we are living in a world that although the world itself may not see the crisis that we are in, they may not understand the crisis that awaits them should they put Jesus off and not confess him as Lord and Savior, but we know and we realize the, na the, the nature of the problem around us, and we should always be aware of the mission that God has called us to, as believers in Jesus Christ, and that mission is to be the rescue unit to the world. God's called us, and He's mobilized us, and the method which He does that with is what we've been preaching about, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been called, we've been raised up for such a time as this to reach out to a world that needs Jesus Christ. Jesus' final departing words when He told the disciples to go wait in Jerusalem, is that you wait and you shall be filled with the Spirit. You'll be empowered and you shall be my witnesses. It's our job. It's our responsibility. It's our calling. If we know Christ, 
than to be a part of that team that goes out and lets the world know that you don't have to die in misery, you don't have to live in misery, your life can be changed, but not only in the present, for eternity, your life can be made new, you can be a new creature, and it can be heaven instead of hell for you if you'll trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I've quoted Anthony Evans a few times. I don't have it on the overhead, but I do want to read this quote from him. And I want you to listen carefully to it because it is so true and so simple, but yet so profound. It says, you are never further from the heart of God than you are when you are silent for unsaved fr to your unsaved friends and loved ones about the gospel and the eternal life that Jesus gives. Catch that? You're never further from the heart of God when you're silent about the gospel to your friends and family. He goes on to say, and you are never closer to the heart of God than when you are telling others how they can be saved and bringing them to the Savior. We're going to see from this message, I think, a truth that most of us already know. Something we preach about regularly is that evangelism, telling people about Jesus Christ, letting the lost world know there is a Savior, that is the, it's one of the essential and main priorities of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not here. He's left us. He's empowered us. We've talked about it for eight weeks, who we are, what God's called us to be, how he's transformed our lives, and the message that we've been given is a message of life. It should run in our veins by now. We talk about it, we preach about it. We should always be encouraging people to come to Christ, inviting people to come to Christ, telling people about Jesus Christ. Why should we do that? Because it is a priority with God. And if it is a priority with Him, guess what? It certainly ought to be a priority with us if it's a priority with God. Now, it's not popular, and a lot of churches won't talk about it. They feel it's imposing too much on the membership to ask them to go out and share their faith with other people. But, you know, I think the big problem is, is that this idea of evangelism, it really runs counter uh, to our natural tendency to see our needs met first. That's where we live. We live in that me generation, in that me world. It's all about me. Even in our spiritual life, what can you do for me? What, God, can you answer my prayer? I have this need. We need this. I want this. I'm praying for me. I'm praying for my four and no more, whatever it might be. And it, it, you know, this, it's all, this world we live in is all about us. People even look for churches like that. What can you do for me? Do you have a nice playground for my children? You know, do you have Xboxes and 360s for my teenagers? You know, do you, do you, do you have fun things for the adults to do? Or do? Do you have a bridge club? You know, and on and on it goes. As people look for more amusement than they do ministry. And we've missed the mark when we become that kind of church. And bless God, may God take me home immediately if we ever come, become that kind of church. Amen? Because it's not about those things. It's not about my job, my finances, my pleasures, my children, and so on. It's really about, I'm here for the glory of God to make a difference in the world that God has placed me in. And if I'll do what God's called me to do, guess what? God will do in my life what needs to be done. So evangelism is a very important part of our life, our ministry, our culture, our church life. That's why we talk about it often, why we preach it often. I want to talk to you about what God says, because God tells us it's important, and the lost world is important. And first and foremost, really, that we ought to be our people who go out, prioritize our life by reaching people first. But I want to look at the way the Apostle Paul frames this. He talks to them, you know, and about evangelism and priorities, but he, he, pen, he, he penetrates his whole mindset of evangelism with these thoughts from 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and a quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. By the way, note those last words there. It is the heart and the mind of God to have all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. First Peter put it that way when it says, listen, God has been patient and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life in Jesus Christ. It's the will of God to see people saved. We're not going to get into these issues of, of, in, in, in the realm of theology this morning about, well, the elect and the non-elect, because that's not what the passage is all about here. It's God's business who the elect, non-elect, and all that is. It's our business to preach the gospel and to pray for all men, for all people everywhere. Now, you would think that as we talk about that and how Jesus has made 
evangelism is such a priority that the first words out of the apostles' mouths would say, okay, so if this is the will of God, then let's go. But that's not what he says. He says, hold up. For just a moment before we go, the first thing that we ought to do is that since the Lord is uh, uh, not willing for any to perish, and it's God's will that we should all come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and let's get to first things first, and first things first is that we should stop and pray. We should pray. We should pray for all people. We should pray they should come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks about the context of, of evangelism. This passage is in the context of being sent. This passage is in the context of the church being the church. And the whole issue here is that first of all, I want you to pray and to pray with a passion, to pray for people to be saved. And he talks about what that kind of passion is and what we're praying there. But he, he does come to these words. So if God wants all people to be saved, what's he want us to do about it? Well, he said the first thing we should do is to stop, take time to seek God's face. We should pray. In fact, we've already talked about one of our sermons, the Great Commission, and all that that really involves, and how that God has called us to go and make disciples of all nations. But we don't do that uh, and last very long if we go without the energy and the power of the Holy Spirit in our life or without God moving in people's hearts and minds. He says, first thing here, first things first, I believe that our calling is to pray before we go. Not only is their emphasis lacking on the going, there's even more emphasis lacking on the praying before you go. We've missed the mark here. Not only are we not going, we're not praying. And I believe that we don't have the burden to go many times is because we're not praying. And when we really start praying like the Bible tells us to pray, then God began to stir up a burden in our heart. You know, it's, 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 it's like never realizing something because you never had something. But when you start praying and you start asking God to touch people's lives and to minister to them, God begins to stir something up in your heart. But he gives us these priority words. And what are they? First thing you do is pray. I want you to pray. And, and, and the praying here, he lists four words in this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 1. First of all, he talks about entreaties. And that's related to a word in the original Greek language that literally means to need something or to lack something. So entreaties are prayers that address a need. I want you to make entreaties to God. For what? For a need. What need? There is no greater need that your family, your friends, or even you have than the need for Jesus Christ. We don't get saved just naturally. It is a supernatural thing. People have to come to a point in their life to realize the truth, to realize the message of the gospel, to understand that Jesus Christ came to save, to set us free, to make us new people in Christ. It doesn't come naturally. The Holy Spirit works in our heart. So we're praying for people. We are making entreaties to God for what they lack. And every one of us lack Jesus Christ until we're saved. The Bible says we're born in our sins. So as we pray, we pray, we make entreaties. And he says, not only entreaties, but prayers. Now, that's the word that always related back to our petitioning the Lord in regard to, in, in, in just acts of worship. And I, I think one of the highest acts of worship in prayer that we can do is when everything moves off of me and my wants or my needs or myself and begins to move to the greatest need that people have in their whole life, and that's to give their life to Jesus Christ. So real prayer of intercession, praying for others, making these kind of entreaties, that moves us to a new realm. That moves us to the place of the heart of God. And we don't reach any higher place in our worship than we're parked right next to the heart of God. And His heart, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's the heart of God. Why did He do that? So people would believe, so people would be saved. So it's entreaties and prayers. And then He says, even, I want you to make petitions. That's, that's a request that we make not on my behalf, really. This is a word which lends itself to praying for someone else's need. What is your need? Again, the greatest need is Jesus. And so in praying for all men to be saved, we're really making a petition for the greatest need that anybody has. Where does that fit in your prayer life? Where does that fit in your prayer time? How often is our prayer really just towards ourselves and we miss petitioning God on behalf of others? And then he wraps it up with entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving. Being grateful and thanking God for what? In specific context here, I believe, saving grace that Jesus brings us for, for what he's going to do and in response to what? To the prayers we just prayed. The thanksgiving is attached to the entreaties, the petitions, the prayers. So what am I doing? I'm praying for people to come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And as I pray, I'm making entreaties. The greatest need they have is Jesus. I'm praying and worshiping God that they'll come to know Christ. I'm, I'm making petition on their behalf. God, meet their need, open their heart, set, themselves, set their minds free to see the truth, to understand the gospel, bring people into their life, use me in their life. All that's in the petitioning process. And as I wrap that up with my, in the name of Jesus, praying, I come back to this point saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what? Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for answering my prayer. Thank you because you're moving in my loved one's life. Thank you because I believe that you answer prayer, these prayers that are according to your will, and your will is that they shouldn't be lost and go to hell. So thank you for answering my prayers because you tell us you always answer our prayers that are paid according to your will. Hallelujah. That's the kind of praying that we're talking about. That's the kind of praying that God wants us to do. It's praying. That's praying with the, the right passion for the lost. That's God's priority. If it's God's priority, then it should also be our priority. And then we're praying, but we're also praying for the right people. The Bible makes us understand that no one is left out when we go and begin to pray for the lost. How do we know that? First Timothy 2.1, we just read it. Praying for all men. That's the end of that passage, that all men come to the knowledge. Praying for people to be saved, seeing that hopefully that no one goes to hell. So we pray evangelistically for unsaved people. But we're not saying it's just enough to, that, that uh, saying, well, I'm saved, that solves the problem. And to all too often, that's true in the church. They think that their salvation is the end all, you know, that I'm saved, so that's good, that's for me. Hallelujah, I'm not going to hell. The rest of the world, that's your business, I'm okay. That attitude doesn't fly in the scriptures, in the church, or with God himself. God has given us responsibilities that when we give our lives to Christ, there's an expectation in the heavenly realm, and it ought to be in our heart that what we have, we share. What we have, we give. What we have, we want to make sure that other people come to know it as well. The obvious here is that all men, you know, you're all familiar with the terrible Titanic disaster where 1,500 people drowned because of that crashing into that iceberg. April 1912, it's made movies and books and all kinds of things have been done around that story. But one of the many tragic things that happened on that particular famous night was, was that many of the lifeboats that were let down from the Titanic that night, many of those boats had room for a lot more people to be placed in those boats. But most of the people, when they got in the lifeboats and they were lowered, they pushed away from the victims that were still in the waters drowning, and they pushed away from the boat because they were afraid that if they turned their little boat around and picked up more people, that they might be capsized, or they might get overcrowded, or they might not make it. Might just turn the boat over. And so they were only concerned about their own deliverance and their own safety. And according to the story and the historians, only one lifeboat turned around, and it picked up six people. When there was room in those other lifeboats for many, many more people. And I think all too often the church kind of has that same attitude. We've been lured down to lifeboat. We've been rescued from the chilly waters of, of, of the misery of a life without God. So we're safe and we're in our little Jesus boat and we're happy. And I know others are drowning, but, you know, we can't force anything on anybody else. So I'm just going to be happy right where I am. And when you live that kind of life, you miss not only seeing people rescued and saved, but you missed a lot of the great blessings that God has for your life. We're out here. We're on the waters, so to say, of the Atlantic. We're out in the waters of the world. All around us, people are drowning. Some maybe don't know they're drowning. That's why we pray. But nonetheless, you know, they, they are lost without Christ. Maybe. Somehow, if we would just kind of hang over a little time and spend a little time on those scriptures that talk about eternity. Talk about hell. Talk about heaven. Those things that talk to us about it's appointed unto man once to die. And then maybe in absorbing those passages, we do just what the apostle tells Timothy. Take some time to pray. And in praying and studying and believing God and seeing what God tells us, you know, God will touch our hearts. I really don't believe we need another pep talk or throw people on some kind of guilt trip. We need to hear what God says to us and begin to open our hearts and our lives to pray for people, our unsaved family members, the unsaved friends, the unsaved co-workers, by name. Ask God to break your heart over their condition, that God would put it in your heart, be the one who touches their life. We pray for all men at all times, and we pray with a passion. Listen to what Ephesians, this is what Paul said, pray. 
Pray that the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And some people say, Brother Joe, I, I, would, I, I, would, I, I would, but I'm a timid or I, I'm a little fearful. Hey, listen, even the Apostle Paul says, you need to pray for me to have boldness. And I think in our own praying, while we're praying for others, we're praying the same thing. God, give me a boldness to speak the mystery of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as Paul Big, strong apostle Paul prayed for this, and certainly you and I ought to be praying these kind of prayers as well. God, give me boldness that I might speak. And then God touched their heart and touched their life. And by the way, if you are fearful at times, you're not alone. Because a lot of people feel the same way. At different times, we, we sense, and it's Satan's work, obviously, and it's our flesh that's intimidated. But once we begin to pray for the lost, once we begin to God move in our hearts, it's amazing what God will do as a result of that. You see... If your family doesn't hear about Jesus, if your friends don't hear about Jesus, if the people you care about don't hear about Jesus, they're on their way to a Christless eternity forever without God, without God's presence. We need to move to that place where the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, where he said, you know, we no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live for ourselves. But whether we live or we breathe or we die, we do it all for the glory of God. And I think a lot of people aren't seeing the power of God at work in their lives because they are living it for themselves. We, we live in the amusement culture. We're, we're constantly amused. We're, we're constantly surrounded by things to entertain us. Uh, you, you know that the, the, the word muse, it means to think. When it put the A before it in the Greek language, the A is a negative participle. It's like if you're a theist, you believe in God. If you're an atheist or an atheist, you don't believe in God. All right? If you're going to muse, that means you're going to take time to think. If you're going to amuse, you're not going to think. And we're living in a generation, the Bible says, in the last days, men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We want to be entertained. We want to be uh, amused. So we don't have to look at where we're headed or what the world presents or the truth about the culture or the truth about society. And if we are just constantly being amused, then we're never going to think about what God has for us. And that's the problem, obviously, I think, also with the world. You know, the world is surrounded. It's like when you look at the culture we're in, especially in this Western Hemisphere, it's like children in an amusement park. You know, we're constantly enthralled by what's going on or what's happening or what's coming out or what material thing there is before us, and we just don't ever think about anything anymore. And we don't want to think about anything. That's why the bars are so busy. That's why the drug industry and the cartels are making so much money. People don't want to deal with life. That's why the liquor industry is so making so much money. People don't want to think. I don't want to deal with my problems. I don't want to deal with my hassles. I want to be amused. I'll absorb TV or I'll absorb booze. I'll absorb drugs. I'll absorb money. Just anything to keep me from really thinking about my life, my future, my family, my eternity. Isn't that true? But the last thing it should be doing is we should be embracing that kind of thing in our, in our lives. So well, how, do we, how do we keep that away from us? And how do we keep from being infected by that mindset? Well, first thing we do, he says, you pray. And you're praying with passion and you're praying for others. It's not just about you. You're praying that lives will be changed. And he, he even goes on to talk about you're praying for right conditions. And that's when he starts talking about kings and authorities, all right? That we may lead a tranquil and a quiet, uh, quiet life in godliness. Now, he doesn't mean quiet life in the fact that we don't preach and teach the gospel. He means in quiet so that when we do preach the gospel, we're not interrupted by kings and governments and authorities. Amen? We don't need the government telling us when we can preach and when we can't preach. We don't need the government telling us when we can stand for Jesus and not stand for Jesus. We don't need the government telling us not to take our faith into the workplace or take our faith into our homes or take our faith into our culture or take our faith into my voting booth. Wherever I go, I take my faith. Why? Because that's who I am. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I'm unapologetic and I'm unashamed. Amen. Somebody else ought to say amen. Amen. And I believe this is the point that he's making here. We need to pray so we can be about God's business. We need to pray so there's not this authoritative interruptions. Now, again, there are authoritative interruptions many times in many parts of the world. That doesn't mean we stop being what God's called us to be. That means, well, as the apostle said, <coughs> should we obey God or man? Well, the obvious answer is, who do we obey? We obey God. That's the priority list. But he says here, you know, we, we need to be praying for these conditions, for kings. And it basically saying we need to be praying for a, a peaceful environment. It's in, it's in that context 
And I believe the main reason we're talking about, you know, the prayer here is the evangelism factor. And so we don't want to be in, in a situation where we can't effectively do that. So we should be praying for a peace that we can carry out the mission God's called us to carry out. We pray for this environment so we can, it'll enhance the spread of the gospel. You know as well as I do <coughs> that the world is confused. Everywhere you turn on the news, there's riots. In the streets in the Middle East, in America, what we need to do is be praying for a peaceful environment so that you and I can go out and be what God's called us to be without the interference of the things around us. <coughs> you know that when uh, an area becomes infiltrated with rebels and violence, unfortunately, some of the first people they evacuate are the missionaries. Amen? So again, it gives us another reason to see that we need to look at the global picture from God's perspective. And pray for peace around those who are serving the Lord Jesus Christ that they can carry it out effectively. It's a prayer for tranquility. And I believe it applies in your home. Pray for peace so you can reach your family for Jesus. It applies in your work. <coughs> Excuse me. Pray for peace so that you can reach the people at work. It applies in government. It applies with your employers. Pray for peace that you can do what God's called you to do wherever you are for the glory of God. The people won't be interfering with the process and saying, keep that out of here. Keep your religion to yourself. Now, don't confuse that in praying for people. In praying for people, we're not praying that they are surrounded with a peace, so to say. They have enough of this pseudo-peace, the amusement mindset of the world. So it doesn't hurt, and I don't think he's saying that we shouldn't do this, that God might perhaps trouble the waters of the people who are trying to reach for Christ. They don't see their need for Jesus they don't, they don't comprehend their need for Christ. And it's not usually until we have some kind of crisis moment in our life that we really get serious about following the Lord. So we're not praying for a necessarily peaceful environment for them in their heart, but an environment for us to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So now that we are praying for the lost, what does he say do now? Well, he wraps it up. Remember, we're reading in context of 1 Timothy. We've read the first several verses there. Now he goes on to say, for their... There's one God and one mediator also between God and men. <clears throat> who is it? It's the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. There it is again. The testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith in truth. What's he saying? We've moved from prayers, first part of it, to proclaimers. I am an apostle. Which, what's that mean? I am sent. Well, we know the Bible tells us that God has sent us all, right? We've all been sent. We are disciples and disciple makers. So we've all been sent. He's one of the first sent as the apostles, all right? He's been sent. He's a preacher, obviously, and an apostle. But every one of us have this responsibility, according to the Scriptures, to proclaim truth and to tell people about Jesus. If we miss that, then we miss the most important thing of what it's all about. So it's not just praying it's proclaiming. He starts with the praying, but the praying is accompanied by the going. And the going is that giving to people who need Jesus the life that God wants them to have. And by the way, if you look at this, he's telling us we have a tremendous, glorious Savior that we have to proclaim. He says there's one God, one mediator between God and man. And who is it? It's Jesus Christ. We have this this mediator, we have this hope, we have this, this way for salvation. The only way to, to be saved and the only way we'll ever know God is through this mediator and it's Christ Jesus. The only way to reach him. You're not going to reach God through Muhammad. <clears throat> You're not going to reach God through Muhammad or through Buddha or through Confucius or any other religion in the world. You're not going to reach God through the Baptist to the Methodists, to the Pentecostals. You're going to reach God through Jesus, Amen. the only mediator, not the Protestants or the non-Protestants, I guess the Catholics. It's not Jesus is the answer. The church doesn't save you. Amen. The pastor doesn't save you. The pope doesn't save you. The priest doesn't save you. There's only one mediator between God and man. So we have something to talk about, you know, don't we? I mean, you've got the greatest news in the world. Nothing gets any better than this. Hey, you don't have to go to hell. What makes you think I'm going to hell? The Bible says all the sins, you're going to hell. <laughs> you're not sin? Well, you know, well, okay, you're going to hell. Amen? But let me tell you how you don't have to go to hell. God sent his son. 
And he came as a mediator between himself and the world. And if you come through him, you can be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Isn't that the declaration of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what he, he's called it. If God reached down, saved you, pulled you out of the pit of sin, so to say, then guess what? You're saved, praise God, but you also have a responsibility to go and be a deliverer for somebody else, to row your little lifeboat up to somebody that's drowning and haul them in for the glory of God. Oh, but pastor, I don't have time for that. Let's see, it takes about three hours to watch a football game. It takes about three and a half, maybe four, to finish 18 holes. Some of you will spend five hours shopping mall. You'll spend an hour and a half doing your nails, some shop. Uh, you'd rather talk about the hunting and fishing, I know. <laughs> but it's all across the board, isn't it? In other words, we've got time. We don't, we don't take the time. We take it for the wrong things. We waste the time. Every one of us got time to pray. Every one of us got time to talk. Hallelujah. We've all got the time. And it's a great, a great message that we have to share. We're talking about God. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about salvation. It's what the Lord wants us to do. And he is the mediator between God and man. He's the way that we're saved. He's the only way that we're saved. If we miss this, then certainly we're going to miss everything that the Lord God himself wants to do. What a great message we have to proclaim. There, I love what Job said. He was t Job was in a dilemma. We knew he was in a crisis. His life's falling apart. Everything's falling apart in his life. And he's getting to this place where he's getting broken before God. And he declares in Job 9, I have no umpire between me, who can lay, between me and God who can lay hands on both of us. There's nobody to stand between God and me. What am I? God's holy. I'm unholy. How am I going to reach God? I mean, that's a good question. If God's holy and no sin enters in his presence and there'll be no sin in heaven, how in the world are we ever going to get to heaven? I need somebody to deliberate between me and God because I've got a problem. I need a peacemaker. But I need someone who can relate to me. So God becomes a man and he puts on flesh. That's what Christmas is all about. Emmanuel, God with us. Deity clothed in humanity. He comes. He's the umpire. He is now, as he said here, the mediator between God and man. Now I have somebody who can talk to me about God and talk to God about me. Who now takes the problem I have, which is sin, and lays it on himself and dies on the cross because the wages of sin is death. So now Jesus becomes my death, all right? And then he was raised in glorious, triumphant, victorious, Victory and resurrection over death, over hell, over the grave. The Lord of Lords. And now I have this glorious umpire who can take my hand, wash me, make me clean, and put my hand in the hand of his Holy Father. That's glorious truth. That's the great grace of God our Father. No umpire? Now we do. There's only one. No matter what the politically correct people might say, there's only one Lord, one faith. There's not multiple faiths. You say, if it's, well, I, I have a faith that's not a Christian. Then you don't have a faith. You have a religion. Faith is based on substance. There's only one that has substance, and that's God and Christ Jesus. Anything else is false hope. But there, this is why we have a great message. Jesus gave himself, the scripture says, as a ransom for all. There it is again. The testimony given at the proper time. As we celebrate Christmas, this proper time, the testimony is remembered. We ought to remember the reason for the season. And the reason for the season, even though we've seen the bumper stickers saying Jesus, the reason for the season is sin. Yes. Jesus came to do away with sin. He said he came to overcome the, the works of the devil. And he came to take away our sins. That's the reason that he could stand as our mediator. That's the message you and I have to share. You don't have to be empty. You don't have to have a lonely life focused on you and you only. You don't have to go to hell. Hallelujah. You can go to life in heaven in Christ Jesus. But he is the answer. But that's the message you have. You know? It, 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 what are you waiting for? It's like, you know, sitting on oil fields and afraid to drill. <laughs> You're waiting for government permission. Right? <laughs> You don't have to wait for permission. Just drill, baby. Amen. <laughs> be what God's called you to be. Let me close with this last verse. 
In 1 Timothy, still talking in about verse 8, he says, and this is when he comes back to the priority of prayer and saying everything he says, you know, that, 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 that Father sent me, Jesus said, let me go back to one of this, I'm getting ahead of myself there, by myself. Jesus tells us that I've come, where are you going? Back up one more. You didn't touch it, promise? Okay. Get your hands off it. I see you touching it. <laughs> All right. Paul said this, that he was a preacher and apostle. What do we say? We say, I'm a Christian, and I've been sent just like he has. I'm a believer. I have, I'm going to participate in this message. I'm not going to sit on the sidelines. It is a game in which we enter. Jesus is not looking for fans today. And he's not looking for spectator. He's looking for people who want to get involved and make a difference in the world, who realize that the world is falling apart around us every day. But even more so, the people's lives are hurting more than they've ever been. No matter how they cover it up, no matter how they gloss it over, you'd be surprised the people you work with are the people in your own family who are looking for answers, who are looking desperately, and many of them looking in the wrong places. So we pray, but we don't stop there. We go, we move forward, and we become players on the field. Today, already packing up around Reliance Stadium are tens of thousands, probably over 100,000 people in and out of the stadium. Are they, they playing here today, I guess? Wherever they're playing, all right? Wherever they're playing, there'll be 100,000 people around that place. Most of them, all but about 30 or 40 of them, they're just spectators. Now, they may be waving the banner, I'm a Texan, I'm a Texan. They're not Texans. They're fans for the Texans, fanatics for the Texans. Well, who are the Texans? They're the guys getting their brains knocked out down on the field. <laughs> Amen? They're the guys working hard every day, training hard every day, you know, putting everything in it every day. They're the guys with the bumps, the bruises, the concussions, and the broken limbs, the pulled hamstrings. Those are the, those are the Texans. We don't have any right to call ourselves the Christians if all we do is sit in our little Jesus lifeboat and come Sunday after Sunday. We're never further from the heart of God, remember, than when it's the way we are. God has called us to participate. I love what the disciples said when they tried to shut them up. Peter and John, we can't stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. There is no better news than what we have. We're going to throw you into jail. Do what you have to do. We'll just tell everybody in there about Jesus. We'll do what God's called us to do. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now let's wrap it up with this last verse. Here it is. I want men everywhere and every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Here's the call to the church. In this passage we just read from 1 Timothy, verses 1 through 8. This is, this is the finale verse to that in verse 8. All right. We need to go, or we need to pray before we go, and then we need to go. And once we go, we're praying for peace so we can do it effectively. There won't be interruptions. We can do it. We can preach the gospel, and lives, lives will be changed. But we need to get our hearts right. So we need, first of all, let's pray and let's seek God's face. This is a, this is a public call to prayer to the church is what it is to pray. Now, we know that many times through the seasons we do that. I mean, we're, it's just special times. I mean, I'm not telling you we did the 316. We ask you to take three people that you had the greatest burden for, pray for them at least once a day for six weeks. I mean, we had the 316 up. And we, I mean, we had that big prayer wall we put up at least once a year, sometimes two or three times a year. It's a big wall to Jerusalem. We put on that wall over there. And we have times we just come up and we paste names on there. Remember when we had the flood here, for those who've been around a while, and all this carpet had to be tore out? Before we put the new carpet in, we put markers all over the altar place here. And underneath these carpet squares up here are literally hundreds of names of people we're praying for and believing God for. We do it often. Why do we do that often? Because that's the first and most important thing we do in reaching the lost. But we don't stop there. We open our mouth because we have what the world's looking for. We have... Jesus Christ. You possess the greatest treasure. The Bible says we hold this treasure in earthen vessels, your body. Use this body for the glory of God by praying for people and by sharing with people. And what better time to remember that than looking for that special gift to give somebody? Make sure Jesus is the gift that's given this year. Of everything you give, bring it all back to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, thank you for the truth of your word.